Black revolutionaries, distillery owners, Italian fashion retailers, and Motown Grammy winners all share their best stories never before told in any other media outlets on Detroit Is Different. Visit DetroitIsDifferent.com or download the Detroit Is Different app on Apple's App Store or Google's Play Store. All right, we are back in effect in the Detroit is Different podcast studios here on Detroit is Different, the podcast. I have one of the few, but it will be a couple more, but <laughs> one of the few returning guests. It's like you and Butch Small right now, I think, that are the <laughs> only... <laughs> So two people that definitely love the Funkadelic. So that's that's a gateway to be a return guest. Well, then I know I'm in. Yes. <laughs> a connection to George Clinton. Yeah, I'm a Funkadeer from way back. <laughs> My man Gia, how are you? Doing great, brother. And I appreciate you inviting me back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And you've shown love also on Piper's podcast and, and uh, just, just to Detroit is different, period. And just the people more so connected to it. And Detroit creativity. And that's really what I want to talk about today. As you're a person that, you know, new buzzwords come come up come up all the time. So, like, I think now they would describe it as you're a curator of culture. That's the lady told me. You have to use the word curator. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm sure probably like 15 years ago or something else. Totally. And, and 15 years before that, it was something else. But you're a person that provides opportunity for artists. Uh, and a lot of the artists that are really from Detroit that are doing cool things. So doing that, it puts you in a unique space because opportunities for artists, I feel, are limited for a myriad of reasons. As I've seen you on so many panels talking about it. <coughs> But let's talk a little bit about Detroit artists and 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 your your feel for it and just getting in getting ingratiated in this whole field as an artist yourself. Um, mm-hmm. What connected you to all these creative people in Detroit? Uh, you know, I think uh, my sister used to tease me because she would if I was going to bring a fella by my older sister, you know, and introduce mm-hmm. her. And then she would say, okay, so what instrument does he play? Hilarious. <laughs> Hilarious. Because I seem to meet a lot of musicians. But um, I really think it just has to do with my own attraction to the arts. Mm-hmm. Uh, I always say that when I uh, get to my next uh, go around here, I'm going to come back as an artist. And because um, I've done so much administration type of stuff that I just want to indulge myself in the free freeness of create creating um on a full-time basis Mm -hmm. so um yeah i'm really attracted to creativity and i'm curious and i find enjoyment i get happy around creative environments and creative people i love having conversations where it's not about uh a conversation about somebody it's about something, some idea, some concept, some possibility. Um, I enjoy that kind of thinking mm-hmm. and dialogue. And so you find that happens a lot around creative people, academics too, uh, you know, who really are looking at ideas and ways of expressing them and roots. What's the root of this idea and what's the potential for it to bloom and blossom how mm-hmm. and what? And, you know, I really enjoy that. So as you talk about that being a process and enjoying the process of an idea developing, um, the the creativity of it is the imagination. Mm. So connecting to that imagination as a kid, were you like into science fiction and um, the stories of the possibility? Were you like a Trekkie as a kid? Like uh, what was that something that you were even into? Yeah, that was more my brother. My brother was real sciencey, mathy, mm-hmm. and like he built a um, hydroplane hmm. out in our backyard and stuff. You mm-hmm. know, he just had this kind of deal. But I was a reader. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really a quiet person, unbeknownst to most. But I'm very quiet. I like to read a lot. Um, I love to sing, and I'm not a vocalist, but I just love the expression. Mm-hmm. And I love to dance, but I'm not a professional dancer. You won't see me doing that, but I love the dance and the, I love rhythm. 
Mm-hmm. I really do. I find the beat. You know, I just love the rhythm. So as a kid, though, I was really studious. Mm-hmm. I was a A student most of the way through. And um, like I said, I read a lot. And um, I was just, I, I, I was not that type. Of, and even now, like, I enjoy being around people who have more of an out, a outsider way of looking thing looking at things or expressing things mm-hmm. because they help me get there because that's not I'm not necessarily fantastical in my thinking okay mm-hmm. because I, I was just wondering like were you just drawn to that imagination of it I always had a very strong imagination I had a very strong uh intuitive mind I always have dreamed and remembered my dreams and could even be active in my dream you know where mm-hmm. I could uh, change the direction of the dream or think about, oh, I want to ask them this and ask the question in the dream and change outcomes. Like mm-hmm. if I was falling, I could make myself not fall in the dream. And so I always was there. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I think I, I always say I'm a person like spiritual culture mm-hmm. and I've just been more in there than I've been outside. But the things I do in life bring me out. Okay. And get me involved in those other types of uh, thoughts and uh, activities. That's interesting. Spiritual culture. I have not heard that connected. That's 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 a very interesting connection. What I had to you? find that. I had to find that so I could describe. You know, there's <laughs> there's this time when you're in college and uh, you're trying to define yourself and figure out your place and figure out your path. And uh, so spiritual culture got clear to me at some point between college and, and uh, you know, uh, adulthood. I, I, uh, that really rang for me about who I am. You know, there was a lot of movements going on when I was uh, coming of age, mm-hmm. teenager and young adult. And there were a lot of movements and a lot of them were based in a lot of aggressive, assertive behavior, mm-hmm. warrior mm-hmm. type skills and and ways of talking and being and I didn't see myself fully there I uh don't get me wrong now you know I was I was taught to battle as necessary yes. but I'm not a aggressor mm-hmm. and uh I thought that was I thought something was wrong with me there that I needed to fix mm-hmm. something there because as a African-American person who was involved and interested in our liberation and upliftment and freedom and f- victory that I was going to have to be willing to fight. Mm-hmm. And a brother who, uh, an attorney, who made a very progressive film um, about the war in Angola, I happened to get a chance to talk to him after the film. And I told him, I said, you know, I feel some way because I don't have this uh, urge to just aggress, to be violent. And he said, in the struggle, it all skills are needed. He said, you know, I made this movie because as an attorney, I had built up the opportunity and had the the uh, information about this issue. He said, but I'm an attorney. That's where I make most of my contribution. He says, so just look for where you choose to make your contribution. All contributions are necessary. and Not everybody is a soldier. Mm -hmm. So that was really helpful for me at that point. You know, a very poignant point in my 17, 18, 19 year old self, you know. Mm To be okay with who N'Gia is and what N'Gia has to offer and to find that outlet and to Mm -hmm. discover my feet on that path and to be to know that I could be positively uh, make a positive contribution in my own way. And with this contribution, like I say, it connects to so much creativity. Um, As you began working with so many artists here. And as you said, even just like did did your organizational skills and project management. And I mean, that's another label, but bringing together some of the ideas, because definitely artists can be very abstract, almost to the point where sometimes for administrative people, <laughs> it, you know, it'll drive us nuts. It gets you know live. I mean? It gets live. Like, it, it's like, OK, all right. Conceptually, how do how does this happen logistically? You know, and it's like, how are we going to pay for that? Yeah. How are we going to pay for (laughs) that? That can be step one. But then it's like, you know, what else does this look like? You Mm. know, it's like, I'm going to put this here and I'm going to have dancers on stage and I'm going to have. And and it's like, uh, have you identified a space where that can all happen together? (laughs) So (laughs) when did 
when did artists begin to take, um, you know, start hearing you out beyond the idea of like, okay, I may be able to get some money with her. Like she can just be my manager. Like when did artists start hearing you out and trusting you with their visions over time? Like when do you see, when did you start seeing that connect? Well, that's really, that really, that really floated me back. Um, I think my persona, the way I present, the way I've been taught and have adapted my articulation mm-hmm. uh, can be convincing. Okay. And um, people tend to trust me, mm-hmm. uh, given opportunity and circumstance. And uh, I can remember really young, I mean, really young, you know, seven, eight, nine year old, that my friends or my schoolmates or even the teachers in the school would single me out to lead Hmm. or to manage. But I very specifically remember I was part of this group down at the uh, YWCA that used to be on Witherell downtown. I think they built uh, the Comerica Park on top of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, That YWCA, I was really active. I was going to CAS at the time, and I had a lot of friends who were uh, dancers and actors. I even, I did some acting and singing. I'd sing in choirs and I would act uh, within ensembles and stuff. And uh, so I guess I was between 13 and 16 years old. And over several years of time, they had a youth theater group down at the Y. And I became part of that. And I was really shy about acting. (laughs) I act up a lot. But when it comes to getting out on stage and just Mm -hmm. being theatrical, Mm -hmm. I tend to shy from that, and uh, but I could do all the other stuff around it. Mm-hmm. I could type, and I, I, I was going to tell you that even in the creativity, I like to type. I like graphic arts, and I like to lay out the words on a page in such a way that it's going to attract you to read them. Mm-hmm. I just know people don't like stuff all packed up, and they like space, and they like brevity, and you know you can put it in a way that people will actually read it. Yeah. So I used to type the programs uh, and I would do my little cut and paste at that time to mm. put some art on it. And um, I could uh, I could write letters and make calls and, you know, manage things. And I remember that between 13 and 16 years old, that's what I did a lot for folks, friends of mine who went on to be professional actors and, and mm. dancers and all that. So I was doing that then. I liked being in that environment. I liked being part of that. And I would tell myself that I was going to eventually, you know, come out and take a role or, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, go to the dance class and rehearse with the group. But I really stayed towards the uh, management administrative parts of that. So even then, you know, it it was present. So at an early age, as it carried on, it just became more and more natural. Totally, totally. And and isn't it's. Because I went to Howard and I got the degree in film directing and broadcast journalism. Mm -hmm. And when I came, uh, you know, and time went on and I came back to Detroit and I was looking for something to do here. And I did not want to get into advertising. Mm -hmm. So I was looking for something to do. And I saw this ad that said, uh, you know, they were looking for an event production coordinator or event program coordinator. I can't remember which. Mm -hmm. But I think the word production was in there because I thought, well. It's a production, and, you know, my degree is in film, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, film direction. I I was a film directing and broadcast journalism. So, but it was all production. And I just felt, well, if I can do the one, I could do the other. And that's when I went and interviewed for that, and it turned out to be the Detroit Festival of the Arts. I will say this, too, that um, what I know is that I'm a bridge, I'm a bridge between people who are creating an opportunity and people who can benefit from that opportunity, who can uh, people who are looking for a talent and people who have the talent that is being sought. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I can act as that bridge. And because of that, I hire a lot of people. And so that endears you to a lot of people. And so that really helped to um, uh, create that, Um, those relationships between myself and the creative community, so to speak, because I'm, I am and have been in position to uh, provide employment and opportunities. Also what happens is that I just, 
I was raised by a missionary mother. You know, my mom was actually supposed to go to college and be a missionary in Africa from uh, her home church in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Uh, She fell in love with my dad. Things change. Uh, No, she fell in love with her first husband and things change. But anyway, the long story short on that is that, uh, you know, I have a missionary uh, vein that runs through me. One who seeks to serve, who wants to help, who feels the the desire, not the I'm not uh, no one's forcing me. I desire to be of assistance. I desire to be helpful. Yes. And so that's comes into play also because oftentimes an artist will want to do something and they have all the creativity they have the craft they they are the talent for what they want to do but they may not know how to produce what they want to do Mm -hmm. and that's a art form in itself as one of my uh on detroit is different uh you can see but uh one of my other big homies in thornetta davis definitely sings your praises about doors and opportunities that you've just alley ooped her over time, just from being that conduit between both spaces. Because that girl's got talent, man. Amazing. That that woman, she uh, something happens when she vocalizes that mm-hmm. doesn't happen for all the people who are really good vocalists. Mm-hmm. But she has a soul. She has a level of expression and feeling that comes through her her voice that uh, I knew. You know, was where I used to tell her, girl, I'm going to help you out. Then I'm going to look up and won't be able to get you because the world Hilarious. will have you, you know. Hilarious. But, yeah, I did. I did because the, she deserved. Not only did she deserve it, I'm saying, you know, by her effort or anything. But to me, the world deserves the excellent creative expressions that people have. The It's what they're here to share. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, I'm happy to do those things. And I love it. I what I found out about myself, like I'm saying with this sheet of paper, like just typing, I just like to arrange the words on the page so it looks nice, mm-hmm. you know. I really enjoy blank pages and then seeing them happen and seeing them succeed, you know. So mm-hmm. just um, I enjoy when someone has an idea of something they want to do creatively and we pull it off and it works and it's success. And the people who are doing it feel good, the people who are experiencing mm-hmm. it feel good is wonderful so even that brainstorming process like that i get energized by that as well Mm -hmm. and i know you do as like where we share many kindred spirits in many ways (laughs) uh the capricorn mind sometimes puts thrust you into like i guess they say like people be like you guys always want to have control and it's like i wouldn't say that per se but we just want to know what the vision is want to want to see it happen well yeah and if i can lay back and and um you know just pull cable and support yeah i'm cool on that but i don't want to be in that space knowing that i could have reset those lights and it would have been a better production and Mm -hmm. i didn't do it yes because i was afraid someone was gonna say and gia thinks she knows everything i i don't know everything (laughs) i'm clear on that so i don't care what they say but i'm not gonna sit here and let something fail especially someone Mm -hmm. who i respect whose talent i respect a uh, production or a circumstance that I want to support and see happen well, I'm not going to say, oh, I got the cord they need in my car, but I ain't going to get it. They didn't hire me it to be the electrician. <laughs> Whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I, I don't have that. I wasn't raised for that. Mm-hmm. I was raised for if I could make it better, make it better. And so I yeah. do what I can. And, uh, and that even um, in that space, because I do find that we all as people, You know, we share in our fears and our insecurities, but definitely many performers and artists are very vulnerable in that Mm -hmm, space. mm -hmm. I I, what I've seen, you know, and sometimes it's been shocking even to me because it's like, man, you're amazing. Right. But they don't even see their they can't own their they can't own their greatness sometimes. Yeah, It's like Mm -hmm. you're amazing. But it's hard because the world be at you. Yeah. This this happened on two different occasions. For me to really get real, real clear about it. One was when we were shooting Daughters of the Dust. Mm -hmm. And there was a scene on the beach. And um, Yellow Mary was reacting to some things that were being said that were real emotional. Mm -hmm. And so we were in the midst of shooting it. I'm focused directly on Yellow Mary. And uh, the director said, hold that. 
uh, hold that thought, give it a few beats, and then slowly turn your head towards the camera. And I'm staring at this actress who was in the midst of a very emotional moment. She sustained that level of emotion while the director was giving direction. And then without missing a beat was able to turn as, re as requested and to fulfill that direction. And I thought about, uh, you know, an actress or, or when we were shooting Eula on the beach and Eula had to get into an agitation she was the pregnant young pregnant sister in this in the film and she had to get into an agitation and kind of spit up in the midst of it like it had just overwhelmed her and we had to take that several times and she had to build up that energy each time mm -hmm. or i believe i have this story remembered correctly and i'm hoping i haven't you know overlapped two three things but i believe when i was in dc we were working on a project and Nina Simone was uh, appearing, uh, performing downtown. Mm -hmm. And I was driving downtown in the production car to go deliver, pick up whatever I was on. And they had the uh, news on that was live from the hall. And you could hear the people shouting because it was 30 minutes late or more. And Nina Simone hadn't appeared yet. And the people were hollering, you know, because they were yeah. stomping. Where is she? Bring her out. Whatever the story. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I found out that that was the day that Nina Simone's mom had passed. Mm -hmm. And I believe this is correct. But anyway, whatever artist, whatever time, uh, their mom had passed. And they had taken that extra 45 minutes, hour, whatever it was, to get themselves together mm -hmm. to be able to go out and deliver this concert as required or requested. Yeah. And so these things really um, affected me to... Um, respect the emotional nature of being a performer mm -hmm. the fact that you are called on like in film you're called on to go through a myriad of emotions and to have all kind of crazy experiences things happen to you physically within the production and just to be in so many crazy places and yet show up saying at the after party or you know what i'm saying this mm -hmm. this da 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 and and then for an artist who you know, writes a hit song, and for the next five years, everywhere they go, people want to hear that same song that same way. And depending upon who it is, it could be the next 60 years. Oh, my gosh. You know, cause, it's crazy. Because I imagine if Tina Turner does a show and she doesn't do. If them big wheels don't keep on turning. Then the crowd will be like. <laughs> I want my money back. <laughs> I went to see her and she didn't even do it. And so, you know, that to me really taught me to respect artists, to respect mm -hmm. the fact that so many of them have a lot of self-esteem issues. I mean, mm -hmm. they got to go out there and do something and hope you're not going to boom. They don't know what the crowd's going to, the response is going to be and how they look and somebody's going to yeah. make a, a remark about it. So I had to respect the, um, the kinds of behaviors that I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. I always say that the cast is crazy and the crew has to appear sane. Hilarious. Because if I can't get hired as a crew member if I show up with the kind of antics yes. that the cast member can get away we, with. We do not need the sound engineer <laughs> freaking out. Being like Bobby Brown on set. <laughs> like that's, that's some Bobby it's Brown that, behavior. You see what I'm saying? Like, no blood. Get back on those dials. Sit down. Nobody want to hear that. Uh, excuse me, sister. You you are holding the boom mic. You are not a diva. You know what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> They'll let you know. So, yeah. So I had to get to understand where they're coming from mm -hmm. because they have to live on the edge so much. They have mm -hmm. to dare themselves to come out there and do what they do and be who they are and and have enough bold daring to show up as that and we all do we all do it every day it's life yeah. but it's it's just uh, multiplied when you come into performance situations it's it's not as many people looking at you mm -hmm. as as it would be if you were you know like i mean it, you know er, everybody's not looking at you speak in your company meeting right you know it's not right. millions of people look or it's not forty thousand people yeah. who just paid a hundred dollars a piece yeah. going over as you go over the powerpoint slides <laughs> yeah. that you're doing like all right let's go to slide three it's right. like slide right. three <laughs> 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 so, 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I definitely, um, in performing myself, and I guess I see it because I still lean towards the administrative end, and I like seeing those productions come together uh, a lot more too. But in performing, I definitely respect it, and I see it more so with many, and like to lend myself in that administrative uh, space more as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. Uh, when when I've done that though. I usually get this. And this is where it's almost like talking to myself, but getting your advice. But, you know, people are like, man, you need to do all of this. You just need to be my manager. You need to just, you know, handle the money. And I just get out here and get on stage. And it's like, all right, hold your horses. I don't know if I'm signing up for that (laughs) just yet. Just yet. But but as you get those offers, Mm -hmm. uh, as, you know, what... What ways over time have you developed these relationships? Because you are as you are that gateway for opportunity for some. And <clears throat> as much as you can be that gateway now for for that great opportunity, sometimes that great performer doesn't fall in the realm of a opportunity. You know, the opportunities in front of your face now. And when you talk to most performers, I remember I was talking to, uh, that's, that's my guy too, Seven in general. I was mm-hmm. like, he was like, man, let's do some shows. And I was like, okay, so where's your audience? If we did a show together, where do you, you know, what, yeah. what east side, west side, east side and west side. I'm like, all right, so, you know, so, you know, we can go to Dearborn. Oh, man, the air people love me too. And it's like, okay, Seven. But you're talking to an artist, you know, a right. reggae band's going to be like, yeah, I'll figure out a way to do the hoedown. <laughs> so how do you... <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were working on this uh, country reggae. <laughs> right, 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 right. How, how have you, um, how have you uh, kept some of those relationships when artists are are really looking for those opportunities? But but you're seen as one of the few people that can give an opportunity, and they feel like, man, and G is not, you know, I, I'm and not I hear it to the table. I mean, I hear it, and they tell it to other people who tell it to me. You know, then G is just not. I've been. I've been calling her for five years. She never put me on, but that's where I really want to make, um, make, uh, make sure things are clear. And I had to get clear. Mm -hmm. What happens is at this point Mm -hmm. is that someone hires me to produce something. Mm -hmm. And within that something, we come up with the definition and the outline of what that's going to be and who and what could fill it. Mm -hmm. And then I'm out there filling that. Yeah. And if they want to, like you said, if they're having the country hold down, then I have not been assigned to go find reggae artists. And even though I love reggae myself, yeah, and it's you know I'm 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 down for that party, but that's not the assignment. Mm-hmm. And in that case, I don't have an offer I can give you, and it it has nothing to do with whether I like you or not. It has to do with the reality that when I go back to that um, presenter and mm-hmm. say. Here's my list of suggestions and they see, you know, the skank, the skank club and they go like, oh, what, what, where are they from? I haven't heard them on country radio. And oh no, that's a reggae band. And then it's like, what, Angie, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. It just, it's not going to, I'm not the final decider Mm -hmm. and I'm not the one signing those checks. And, and that relationship right there, because that's what's so tough for most artists, but I think especially here. In Detroit, because the the balance of of opportunity has been so. It's more stages needed here. It's just more stages needed here in in a lot of ways. Uh, The think tank I did for the Detroit is different festival was about that. So with the few stages that do exist, it's almost like you feel like, man, if I didn't get African World Festival this year, I know. And, and I feel a way, don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. I feel a way about it. I, I want I want to give as much opportunity as possible. I want to support mm-hmm. uh, because there is so much talent. Yeah. You know, it's not like there's just five acts that are good, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. You know, there there's a large number of really excellent talent in the city of Detroit and its surroundings. Yeah. But there's, as you said, there are limited stages and limited slots on those stages. And I only have oversight over so much of it and like i said a lot of what i'm doing is fulfilling uh directions Mm -hmm. as opposed to establishing i i'm i'm not telling them we're going to make this stage our r&b stage that's not necessarily the the direction capacity of it and so yeah so it's not always possible to um 
uh, to provide an opportunity. I, and that's something I've been really wrestling with over time, over time. Like I've been real tempted to open a facility and, and uh, you know, become a presenter myself. And, you know, I've looked to create some festivals and, mm -hmm. you know, here maybe I'll just make a series over here and us and that. And um, it's something I'm, I, as as things are, like today's report is that I have gotten to a space where there is a bit more time where I can, um, as opposed to fulfilling contracts, there's some time for me to produce or create some things. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, though, is that I literally have some things that I personally want to produce and create. Mm -hmm. And so how much of that time am I going to give to creating a space for others Mm -hmm. Or, you know, since it's so the time is limited, opportunities are what they are, then, you know, how much of that time I'm going to give for myself. But especially um, in the area of hip hop artists, um, uh, R&B, soul, I don't have as many slots to offer as I used to. Yeah. There you, we, we ended one series in the downtown parks, for instance that used to hire a good mm, somewhere around 60 to 75 local artists every summer. Mm -hmm. And that series uh, was ended by the sponsor of that series. Yeah. And so, you know, just uh, there have been cutbacks into what I'm able to uh, schedule, the type of acts that I'm able to schedule. And, and then when we talk about that, and this is kind of back to the administrative end, it's an ecosystem with this, too. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> with the Detroit is Different Festival, the question was, I, I think events take place on like four facets. The audience, the performer, uh, the the promoter and also the place mm -hmm. and all four in my mind, how I'm graphing it out, at least play a role in the experience that's created because many need to match. Mm -hmm. And then if you add in like the sponsorship, which kind of I think comes from the lens of what the promoter may be, you know, then now you really are it's it's a new dynamic to to feed into the ecosystem where it can't just be a um like a one off. It's been a lot of events that may have happened once or twice here. And, and it's like, OK, this is a great experience for an attendant. I love attending this. But I look at the place and I look at the promoter and I think to myself, like, did they really pull out of this something that was substantially beneficial for the vision that they have, as you were talking about? Because I hear something like 75 acts. That's great. But did the ecosystem feed into where everyone walks away and says, OK, this is this is like. I, I love this vision, even over here in my own neighborhood. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the, the studio, if you've ever come over here. But like in the summertime, uh, especially around Labor Day, um, you come up off the lodge uh, over here off the Davidson exit uh, from 75 or the lodge near Linwood. It's it's off the service drive. They do a big block party where they bring in farm animals. They will have comedian performers. I mean, being that I sleep over, <laughs> over there for some people, it'd be like, Oh man, they're killing me every night, but it was cool, you know, but like just keeping that thing going for the few families that were investing in putting that in good entertainment for the attendant. But for the producers of the event, it was like, all right, we need to keep these relationships with the children. We need to, it, it, it was a disconnect. How, how can, um, how do you feel that uh, things can connect a little bit more or is it just a, a vision of volition or it'll just take its own form? Like, how do you how do we connect all all parties where the experience is not just between performer and attendant or the performer getting the check and feeling like it's happy or the crowd like, OK, that was a great performance that I got for free. How how do you connect everything? Well, you know. We're not uh, starting from scratch. And so that makes a big difference. There mm -hmm. are systems in place. There are expectations that have been developed by others that mm -hmm. then spill over into your camp, you know. Mm -hmm. So one of th I, I speak about this all the time. Our community has whole, a whole bunch of talented folk. Mm -hmm. And we have talented folk who are performers. We have talented folks who are the sound lights and stage and, 
you know, special effects people and we have talented PR people and we have a lot of different talented people. The majority of them are not looking for opportunities to work together where they are not going to make some money. Mm. Um, and so just because we have all the talent to do something doesn't mean that we have uh, the finance available to make it happen. Yeah. And that undercuts a lot of what I think are opportunities for us uh, in our community. Mm hmm. The um, for myself, for instance, and when I think about having a space and producing activities and performances and all that in that space, then I've got to think about all of that. I got to think about the insurance and keeping the utilities on and having the staff and doing all the promotions and paying the acts and providing whatever food and drink. And, you know, the the all of the stuff mm -hmm. is on that presenter. Mm -hmm. And then my audience, however, what is their willingness? Yeah. Like in order for everything to get paid and for me to come out with a few dollars, let's just say it takes $50 a person, but my audience wants to do twenty twenty five. If If that, depending. Yeah. And yeah. I'm just saying that. So that's where we have a, even, you know, sometime when we're doing these festivals and events and I look around and there are all these um, grantors but very few, if any, but very few, let's say, uh, who are aimed at African-American culture, mm -hmm. whose purpose is to support and promote African-American culture. Yeah. You know, so where do we write that? To whom do we write that grant application? You know, who do who's going to come and help underwrite? Because that's what happens with a lot of performances. Mm -hmm. They don't. The event itself is not always profitable. There, there are underwriters and there are supporters and patrons and there, you know, there are ways, uh, sponsors and all that make that happen. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that, which in our community isn't always available. Yeah. You need to make your money off the door. Mm -hmm. And actually, I definitely don't think you may not know that. I'm pretty sure your son knows this guy. But uh, <laughs> I had the longest conversation with uh, a, a WW wrestler rhino he's he's mm. in detroit uh or detroit base he actually ran for i want to say city council in dearborn or something mm. and he was he was doing a series of wrestling events and he's like well we don't even look to the door to make money we're just looking for different forms of sponsorship now what he's doing and what that audience is mm -hmm. it's it's other things going into him producing his event mm -hmm. whereas every time i produce an event you know, I get some people to give just off the reputation I've built um, and I'm willing to always ask. Uh, I send out, you know, this this year I sent out a letter to 30 people all asking, you know, can you give five hundred to a thousand dollars for this Detroit is different festival of those 30, you know, uh, you know, seven responded, you know, two responded with a thousand, a couple responded with two fifty. It just that's how I've approached it because I really do need to rely on my door to make mm -hmm. things function for how I deliver events. Yep. Um, and uh, it, it's it's also pushing me connecting even with Piper Carter to uh, to look at events and say to myself, I have to create experiences, which more people are talking about that. The experiential entertainment, as people say, because I also understand my, my performers. Even my closest performers, they may perform two places that same night. Mm -hmm. So if I'm charging twenty dollars for a ticket and then that other place they're performing may be free. You know, it, it I, I'm, I'm selling the theme way more than I'm selling the performer, per se. Mm -hmm. And I'm staying ahead of myself, just looking to be more creative about how do I make this happen? It's, it's interesting. I, you know, and one of the. One of the specific things that happens in my case is that my interests are in the cultural arts. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then my value system is in spiritual culture. Mm -hmm. So there are things that I want to produce and there are things I don't choose to produce. There are things I don't choose to focus on making opportunities for. It's not my interest to spread it, develop it. It be a not, part of it yeah not yeah. what i'm interested in and and hopefully i can do that without judging the other thing but the point being is not my interest 
Well, it happens that, for instance, the fact that there are so many free festivals Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, then people expect free, free entertainment. Yeah. And if there's a charge, then oftentimes, for for instance, when um, when we want to bring a emerging artist who's doing an indep- you know independent artist, yeah, fi- of uh, uh, performing artist, well, that's one thing. And then somebody else is bringing Erica Badu. Well, people will pay. A hundred and fifty dollars for that ticket to see Erica Badu, and then they'll argue with you about that twenty dollars you charging for this for this other show. And it and it's dependent upon the time, because I think the jazz festival that takes place in Detroit mm-hmm. is such a great experience that I would be afraid to bring almost any jazz act or produce. I mean, even the jazz show at Motor City One, I would have to really think of a very creative theme. If I plan to do anything around jazz in the month of August or September. Yeah, most of the time when we're doing these summer events and I'm trying to add some jazz to the schedule, Mm -hmm. then, you know, I shouldn't say most time, but oftentimes I'm told, well, you know, they the jazz fest handles all the jazz and people not really, you know, that's not really what people really that interested in. And, you know, and if you're doing it's, it's just that that's why I was saying, like, we didn't create this. There's been a. You know, there's been years and years, decades and decades of developing this entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. And it has um, become an industry with people who have bottom line calculations about how it it is to operate. And then you come in with your independent alternative thing and you've got to really figure out some creative ways to make those things happen without losing your shirt or having a big fail where you. You, d- you don't have enough money to promote. So it was a great show for the seven people who were able to be there. You know, yeah. it's all of that. It, it's it's really deep. I mean, that, that's why I've hesitated to open a place because it, it just I work a lot uh, with the events that I do. And then if I open my own independent space, I just felt like it would just be no end. I just when do I get to stop working? It just doesn't happen. Yeah. And, you know. Um, as much as what I do as work is what I enjoy, I just don't want to work myself to death. I, I just want to sit on the beach every now and then and just be on the beach. Uh, so, you know, just trying to look for that balance. And um, also, I'll tell you this, Kari, I you know, you were mentioned before, like, so I'll present. I, so in the summer, we're doing all these events. So we're hiring all these people, you know. 100 200 300 over a summer i don't know what that number is yeah and um and then uh people will be like wow and gia you know why don't you be my manager (laughs) yeah i can imagine and so i had to really get clear i had thought about it because i have a lot of friends who are booking agents and artist managers and you know it looks interesting and fun in that area work too but i just had to look at the fact that um that they I think they call it the Peter principle. So for instance, you'll have a teacher who is excellent, wins teacher of the year, all the kids love her, everybody who go and him, you know, who everybody goes through that person's class, succeeds and is doing great. And then you'll say, Look, you have been such an excellent teacher, you're doing so great, so we're gonna move you up to vice principal because we think that, you know, you could uh, and then they go to be vice principal and they're not really that good at it. Mm-hmm. And things fall apart and everybody gets upset and they have to leave the district in disgrace. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And that's what they say. Like, you'll be good at something and they'll keep promoting you till you get out of your sphere where you really excel. So I had to look at that for myself um, based on I like projects. I like projects because projects run and then they stop. There is some breather at some point. Mm-hmm. Whereas being someone's booking agent or artist management or artist manager when does it stop you know when is the break when is the moment and you are so focused on someone else's thing i that's 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 a lot and you know what you just said puts us in kindred spirits again (laughs) because i look at it like i tell people it's almost like pick up basketball you know and you may play we may be playing that pick up basketball game every day so that 
you know, I may do one project with you and then that leads to another project with you where it's almost like we work together Mm -hmm. possibly for five years straight back to back to back to back to back to back to back. But the I guess the 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 commitment to the project, what I find uh, brings better energy to completing the work more so than like like what you said, like a never ending almost commitment to. um to a concept, you know, whereas I, I believe I, I agree with you. You know, I've been working more with comedian Josh Adams, but it's way easier when we have like a goal in mind on a project than it is on a like, let's just help your career. Cause mm-hmm. I don't even know what the, I don't well, know where to start with that. Well, you know, it's interesting too, because, um, well, um, <laughs> the appreciation and the respect for someone's talent does not always uh, equate to really liking that character, that personality. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that the fact that I really love how someone performs and I make opportunities for them because I just feel that they fill the bill and it's always a great experience for the audience and blah, blah, blah. Doesn't mean that that, person is someone that I want to be so intimately attached to as a booking agent or a manager Mm -hmm. and that the way they behave when they're not on stage may not be a um a way that I'm going to tolerate over time Mm -hmm. and so you know that all of those factors come in there you know but I know some people who are booking agents and who are artist managers and they are excellent at what they do and they enjoy what they do and they are skillful, crafty about, you know, being Doing able to that. support some, yes, yeah, support someone's career and really help an artist package and deliver themselves a- and climb. So that's why I say it was really learning me and, and learning what, what I can bring to the party that is actually a contribution. What the doctor, what, what the, uh, what the lawyer told you that directed the, the mm-hmm, movie, you, are, mm-hmm. you know, we all play different positions Yeah, and I do like the project based position. Yeah, I, I think for me, me it raises more of my energy. It brings a focus, uh, and, and I get more lessons out of it. Cause I, I like change I too. Yeah. Yeah. I like change. I like the fact that today I'm working on this festival and tomorrow I'm working on this special event and they're different and the focus is a little different and you know not always doing the same thing the same way and you know just learning new things i i enjoy the variety of it all so uh, for for some of the artists listening that uh that are thinking like that and then also for the for the presenters and promoters um such as myself what would you say right now is something that you think they need to be aware of um, for the climate of Detroit when offering culture for our people, culture for black folk? Hmm. Well, well, I, this is, this is kind of the way I like to approach things. I like to know what the goal is. Mm -hmm. Like if someone asked me to, help them with an event or activity I want to know what is it that's going to cause you to feel like this was successful Mm. and so I think an artist needs to clarify for themselves what is success to that person that can be an extremely difficult question to answer for most Americans (laughs) yeah and we have to we have to come to some understanding of who we are and what our values are uh, because not every I remember this sister and um She was saying with the Howard Gospel Choir, that's where I met her. I used to sing with the Howard Gospel Choir. Mm. She was a soloist. Mm -hmm. And she just had this tremendous voice. It was a voice that could succeed commercially. Mm -hmm. And um, so I used to ask her, why you don't go for that career? And it turned out that she had grown up as the daughter of a lounge singer. And it was a very difficult life and a strange life. Uh, she had to be with her grandmother a lot because her mom was traveling so much. And it was just a lot of different, you know, things. A lot of, a lot of cigarette smoke and, you know, and just it was just a lot of things. And so she really did not want to have that experience. Yeah. And so she got a law degree and went on to be very successful uh, with her career. 
Um, but she had this voice that was it was unique and it was outstanding. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she but based on her value system, based mm-hmm. on what she had come to know, what she had determined was success and success had an element of happiness to it that she didn't see guaranteed in that type of career. Mm-hmm. That she couldn't control certain elements and she didn't want to go that direction. So, again, I go back to the notion that whatever it is you choose to do in life, whatever, whatever part you're going to play, let it grow out of what feels good to you. Mm-hmm. Where it, They say that it's best to do what you would love to do even if no one was going to pay you for it. That you'll really excel there because your passion and commitment is there. Your interest is there and you will focus and and become excellent at that thing. Uh, But for the artist, it's really important. When I went into film school, my girlfriend said, well, Gia, you know, what if you get this degree and go into film and then nobody wants to see your films? I said, oh, I got people going to want to see my films. Mm-hmm. I said, because I can go back to my church and I can scream oh, yes. my film <laughs> and they're going to be like, oh, baby, that is so beautiful. We're so proud of you, yes. honey. And they're going to press a dollar in my palm and say, you just keep on keeping on. I said, and I can go to the nursing homes and I can arrange screenings of my films and people are going to like them. I said, you know, you got to determine what is success. For me, the success was completing a film and getting my story on film and having completed that project. That for me was the big success. For some people, if you don't get a Spike Lee worldwide yeah. celebratory, you know, status, yeah. then it ha- it ain't no good for them. So you just got to know so you can prepare yourself and position yourself to reach what for you is success. What those goals are. You got to know them and you know, and things change and we grow and there's adjustments and you're going to have experiences that are going to help reshape or, you know, um, uh, change what you have put, uh, you know, what you had planned. But that's all part of that process is is continuing to live. I mean, the, the we're here to live and we it, it, living is about change. It's adapting to that change. And so you have a goal and, you know, you make your way to it best you can. And and I definitely look to you as someone that has grown in a field that very few, okay, very few women are in the space you're in. Definitely very few black people, a black woman in your space is like unprecedented. Um, so it's inspiring just to know you and to see your story to know that, okay, you, you can, you can really walk on your own path. And so much of even a lot of my path and my journey is what you just stated. Like mm-hmm. with Detroit is different festival 2019. It was, can it happen? Mm-hmm. Can I pull it off? Will will I have these flyers and will I have all of the resources present where I can get the buy-in from my podcasters where we do something together. And that'll be the goal for 2022 as well. You know, I start thinking about what amount of attendance and, and how much, you know, like what those variables we can control, the serenity prayer. That's definitely always level one of where success lies in my mind. Uh, and that's usually the advice I give to people. But it's hard because I do think that the barometer of success for many people is so impacted by the messaging, outside messaging we're receiving. Well, you know, this is where um, I'm grateful for the home training I had. Mm hmm. Um, Because that home training allowed me to carve out my own notion of success and for it to be reflective of me and my family and community. Yeah. A lot of our young people are watching too much TV. Sure. And their their concept of success reflects a script off of television that they are upset with themselves for not having been able to make real in their own lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, the... um, I I opened a little gift shop some years back and this woman came to our grand opening day and she said in Gia, she was a professional woman and you know, I was grateful that she had come, you know, and she made a couple purchases and she said, you know, in Gia, this is really nice and it's all lovely. She said, but where's your catalog? I had been open, I think three weeks at that point. I mm-hmm. said, catalog and then this is years back mm-hmm. <laughs> i said a catalog she said yeah you know like sears they have a catalog 
And I had to stop myself because then that smart mouth in Gia was about to show up, you know, mm-hmm. because Sears been in business for 150 years, ma'am. You yes. know what I'm saying? And there are other people who could have opened my shop and would have had a catalog, but they also had people, family members who were going to donate at a level that included catalog printing. That wasn't true in my circumstance. Yeah. And uh, so you have to be you have to be satisfied to get started. You have to allow yourself to start at whichever level. I'm not dictating anybody needs to start where I started. I'm saying at whatever level you're able to start, start there and grow. Yeah. Start there and grow. If it's true that you have the one point five million dollars, then you can start at a level much greater than those of us who start with one hundred and fifty thousand dollars or who start with two thousand mm-hmm. dollars. You know, there's there. So do you. But be able to make sure you plant yourself out that that um, example that they use where if you take a flower, a, a bloom and it's in one of those little starter green starter uh, pots that you get at the nurse, you know, the florist or garden shop. And you take that home and then you put it in a six inch pot. It's going to die because its roots can't reach the bottom where the water goes. And so it dries up and dies. So it's better to take it and put it in a three inch pot and let it fulfill itself in that three inch pot and then move it to the next size pot. And that is true also with your ideas, with your life, with your love. Don't, you know, give it a chance to grow within the environment that it's in so that it can then be moved as a strong plant with strong roots into its next level. Uh, a lot of what you say goes right into my belief or how I interpret this goes against the premise of what America is based on, which is capitalism and scarcity is the premise of capitalism or economists would argue that like, so it's like, it's a limited supply to meet that limited demand. So like, it's just enough for just enough, which fast forwards the microwave idea of everything being now now i need it now it it needs to happen now and even the stories in the way media delivers stories so like uh for instance um last year with the old town road little nas x so it's like wow you know it's just this 16 year old guy that's sitting around doing a dance on tiktok and now he's so he had the the biggest selling song in america so then that's one songwriter sitting at home like man i've been writing songs for 25 years and i never had i've never been charted anywhere Mm -hmm. you know and um these concepts can get incepted, but that's another be- thing that I found beautiful about the inside of the administrative, like getting on the in- administrative end. I see so much smoke and mirrors of entertainment and I'm not negating any of his talent. I'm not negating any of the song. But now I realize that when it is the 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 Justin Bieber, or the little Nas X or the, you know, even little Michael Jackson, it's probably it's connected to little Michael, any of those young artists are probably decades of other people that have built relationships and those relationships have lasted long and experienced. So you see, you know, you see Whitney Houston in your face at 17, but that's Clive Davis and not just Clive Davis, the people that helped Clive Davis become Clive Davis and all of these other people, uh, Whitney Houston's mother, uh, you know, Whitney Houston's auntie, uh, Dionne Warwick, uh, and all the people they've worked with. So it may be, uh, she's, her talent is, you know, obvious, you know, and it's, and it's great. But the opportunities are sometimes being placed by, like what you said, these these roots that have been rooted deep for years and generations where the packaging of the marketing may be. Look at this, you know, look at this five year old dance. Well, see, that's where we're talking. That, that's where we're talking about. Uh, the. Um, the circumstances around. Uh, and we're talking about a performing artist right now. So the yeah, circumstances yeah. around a performing <clears throat> artist. So I remember when Aretha Franklin came out mm. and started a professional career. Yeah. And at that time I was singing in church choirs here in the city. My oldest sister was a vocalist. Mm-hmm. And when she sang, everybody ran the aisles, fainted, died because mm-hmm. she could throw down. Yeah. That we would 
go to these other uh, churches and go to some of these gospel music conferences here in the city or concerts in the city. Mm -hmm. And there would be at least one singer from each one of these places who could just, you know, knock it out the park. They yeah. were just uh, everybody fainting, hollering. They just had that way of emoting and carrying the song. And it was just one of those things. And um, so when Aretha became the big deal, I mean, Aretha was very good. Yeah. And excellent in all of who she has been purported to be vocally and all that she certainly is and was. But I also knew some other people at that level of yeah. of uh, presentation. Yeah. And it just happened who pursued a career, who had the connects to get that next step yeah. up, who could be introduced to whomever. And that's where this whole notion of an entertainment industry starts to show up. That's different than the concept of someone who really loves to sing and just really loves to do it and is so good at it and really becomes you know everybody that's their go-to person like let's have some like Thornetta Thornetta was here in this community and you could call Thornetta and she would come and you know she would just make bring something special to your program yeah and uh she was available and was the home girl I mean, and ma even even to this day like to this son, day she sung at my mom's passing, mm -hmm. but she sung at so many people's passing yeah. out of love. Yes. Where she's connected to people's families where it's like she sung at my father's passing. Mm -hmm. She sung at her, her service, my mother's service, my aunt's service. And it's like, wow. When, you know, when I just pass out a flyer with her, the stories that people tell me mm -hmm. show her relationship with Detroit. So has Thornetta been a success for a lot of years? You know what I'm saying? Like if if and until she's uh given a Grammy or un if and until she is on late night with somebody, mm -hmm. has she not is she not a success? And that's why I say, you know, you've got to figure out your own definition of success. Yeah. There are people performing, presenting, um, sharing their craft at all different levels. There are people who are stars in their own city. And are not known in other places. Yeah. Um, there are people who are excellent jazz musicians that, you know, those of us who are jazz fans, we know their name. We can hum most of the tune. And then there are people who have never, ever heard of them. Yeah. Because those folks are not into jazz. I, I remember t mentioning Harold McKinney to someone out of out of Detroit and I said da 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 Harold McKinney and they said wait a minute who is Harold McKinney and this person was into jazz but yeah. we were on the east coast uh -huh. and they didn't know Harold and so that's my story like in America we have this we have this media generated notion that success is when you are recognized and um, promoted celebrated by what is called the mainstream the machine and until then, you don't, no matter what, you're not a success. Mm. And I just, I wasn't raised with that understanding. Mm -hmm. I was raised that we could have our own stars, that you could be the star at Mount Olive Baptist Church. And we would consider you successful. And within our community, you were our star. Yeah. And some people were satisfied with that level of doing. Mm -hmm. Harold McKinney told me one time that you know he had the opportunity to go to New York when everybody else was going to New York back in his time and you know the John Coltrane all these people were coming through Detroit and they were like oh my gosh you guys have all these excellent jazz musicians they would say is it something in the water you know so Harold had the opportunity to go to New York he said he made the conscious decision to stay in Detroit because he said somebody had to be here to encourage and develop the next generation. And he also said he wanted to have a family. And he didn't want to be on the road and absent from his family all the time. That was a conscious choice. Not a lack of talent. Not a lack of contacts and resources. It was a conscious decision based on what was success to him. And somebody I always talk about when, when you come here is my late godmother, Orthea Barnes. And it used Orthea. to blow my mind sometimes the way she would talk about her shows because Harold in that same vein mm -hmm. and, and many other great performers that I'm learning more about as I, as I learned just the culture of what live entertainment was at one point in time. And you are, you know, you were, you're, you're of age where you experienced some of that and you're definitely obviously in the mix now, 
But she even talks about her show. She'd say, okay, what would happen? <laughs> she'd tell me. She'd be like, we would rehearse on, went on Tuesday and Wednesday. The band would have off Monday usually. Mm -hmm. We would rehearse Tuesday and Wednesday and give the same show, you know, once on Thursday, which would probably be a free night. Friday night, uh, twice. Saturday night, three times. Once on Sunday. And I'm like, you do the same show? And mm -hmm. she was like, yeah. And some people would come and back hit. twice That's a weekend. Right. And it would be, uh, what she say? Like, she's like a comedian host, a shake dancer, as they called it. Like mm -hmm. almost like a, not necessarily like a stripper, but. Uh, like a burlesque type. Yeah, of a burlesque act. type mm -hmm. act, entertainer. And her, you know, and the vocalist. With and the I'm band. Like, with the band. And mm -hmm. I'm like, people would come. Like, it just, you know, in the form of how we experience entertainment now, mm -hmm. it's like, you would go on Friday and Saturday? See, you got it. You got it. See, this is, and this is to me, like, where it's kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of people have a lot of negative feelings and depression around this. But change is inevitable. Yeah. And we would get bored if everything stayed the same all yeah. the time for the 157,000 yeah. years. We just wouldn't be able to take it. So... That was then, based on all the socioeconomic realities of black people in the city of Detroit. Yeah. The majority of folks had just come up from the South and were just starting that new generation that was being born in the North. And so the pattern from the South as to how shows were delivered was still present. And people had started, uh, had come up here to make some money. So now they're working in these factories and there was some money going on. And so there, all of this grew out of those realities. So now 2020, here mm -hmm. we are. The majority of the factories have laid off and, you know, the post office Don't laid exist. off. Yeah. The education system laid off to the point where the they really decimated a significant number of people out of the African-American middle class. Mm -hmm. And so who has leisure dollars? Expendable income. And what do they choose to do with them? Mm -hmm. And what has the, the back then television was just getting started mm -hmm. now it is prevalent yeah. and it has now added to it the internet and all of these other ways of delivering information and controlling and developing what people think and what they consider to be entertainment entertainment mm -hmm. and so here we are now in that reality how now do we um once again grasp the attention and interest of our community so that our community will invest in a homegrown entertainment industry yeah. or community or whatever so that's our job now is to figure that thing out and make it happen and um that's what i'm interested in uh as as i said you know i think time has gone by and i now have people in place and situations that may allow me a few more hours to do some mm -hmm. things that I create myself or with those I choose to create it with. And so how do we create something that interests our community and that, you know, then allows us to present who we want to present yeah, and successfully s create a sustainable something so that we can every week, every month, every day, whatever continue these presentations it's for us to figure this thing out and the again my story is a lot of people don't want to hear this but my story is maybe it starts with a living room concert and and, you know and we build it out of there as opposed to trying to go recreate the 20 grand in the next 15 yeah. minutes yeah and it may be like that uh, the 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 thing I'm most excited about now when I when I do see them that I see a culture being created around it, you know, and it's definitely somebody you know dearly. I bring him up when we talk often too. Is what Baba Malik and the the whole Molly Wap team is doing. It's almost like a culture created mm -hmm. around the Molly Wap mm -hmm. show, where it's like it's not necessarily funk, it's not necessarily rock, it's not necessarily reggae. It's not necessarily hip hop. It's not. Ne I don't even know how to label it, which in some ways, as I think about offering people entertainment experiences, that's kind of an allure within itself. Well, that, you know, this is um, I, I think and I've, I've asked many great minds and I'm hoping to have 15 minutes to focus my mind on this thought also. And that is. In New York City, 
we now all know the story. They took all the arts out of the schools, stopped teaching music in the schools, took all the instruments. So now these young people did not have that Mm -hmm. opportunity that decades before everybody got to go be in the band and and there was music and that was generated in the schools. And then some enterprising young people said, "Okay, well, what we can do since we don't have instruments, but we have these LPs, we have these albums of recorded music. And if we work it, we can pull snippets of various records together and create the music that we want to create. And we can, we can, instead of having a band and a vocalist, we can have a DJ and a person on mic mm-hmm. and we can create some music and we can control this and we can now talk about the things that our community want to talk about and we can create those dance rhythms that our community wants to dance to. And these folks successfully did this on their own without funding without any major anybody yeah. underwriting and got it to such a level that every major everything showed up trying to co-opt it. True. And I'm just wondering now, you know, what is our um, opportunity now? What do these vehicles look like? Yeah. What, how, what is it? Like you're saying, Molly Wap didn't say let's just be... Uh, a reggae band they said let's take all of the influences all the creativity the all the cultural yeah. art that we enjoy and let's put it together in our own sound something that's true to those of us who are members of this group and that speaks to our community and with our community let's build yeah and that's what they've been doing they've been steadily building they've been steadily building and it's been helpful that Malik is so well known and respected within the community. So that draws a constituency and other True. members of the group. All of that's good, but they would not have held them if when folks got there, that rhythm wasn't speaking to them. Yeah. That experience wasn't yeah. an enjoyable one. I agree. And so they have a formula that is working for them and, and they're building on that. And yeah. so that's what I'm suggesting that let's look around at the things that we want to do if we're if we are interested to invest our time and our talents in focusing on building within our community mm-hmm. by pooling our resources, pooling our monies, pooling our talents and building something of our own. And that that the way you made that analogy is definitely that cuz it's almost like live music sampling of a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And as a patron and an attendant, that's the other thing about some shows. I feel like the live experience sometimes, even as I, you know, hip hop's my favorite. I love it. I do it. It's it's my favorite art form of all. And then comes funk. (laughs) But but in it, the the live hip hop experience nowadays is just something that I look at and it's like, oh, man. You know, I, I have an idea. I have a preconceived. I have a prejudice of what I think the hip hop show will be, and that's not a show. Even as a person that loves hip hop, mm-hmm. and that may be one of those things that when people are thinking about sponsoring or producing a hip hop show, because I'm thinking the artist is gonna come on stage. Like the show will start at say nine o'clock. It'll probably start at ten thirty. The 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 main artist will probably perform for twenty minutes, and he'll be like half high and be on stage with like forty people. You know, and I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He'd be yelling at me, throw some water on me from a water bottle. It's like, eh, do I want to pay $30 for this? You know, whereas even the Molly Wap experience, it feels the, the crowd feels like a different energy at their show, which the only thing close to it that I can remember when I was a kid, because my mom, well, I'm a Funkadelic fan, took us to some early shows to see George Clinton when we were kids. And I was like, what is going like, you know, I'm like, <laughs> right, right. I'm like, you know, six <laughs> years old looking at, you know, my mom made a point for us to see James Brown live and the Funkadelics live. And the James Brown show was cool, but it felt like not and not just, you know, people smoking weed, which that happened. But it felt like the crowd was as much a part of the show as it, it definitely felt way more like uh <laughs> Like George Clinton was like a, 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 I guess like leading an orchestra of not just his band but the crowd too. It was interesting. Mm-hmm. That's all I can say. So and I'm like, okay, I'm seeing this in the early '90s. So I'm like, damn, I wonder what the hell this was like in the '70s. It was probably 
It was it was all the way live. <laughs> you know, my <laughs> my dad tells live. this story where like he was like, you know, they used to do this thing where like they'd act like they were tuning up the instruments and slowly but surely they'd start playing the song and go right into it. Yeah. And you wouldn't even know it. And he was like, you know, and then we would be so high and it, it really like, oh, you know, <laughs> I would I used to go. Because a lot of the time, you know, when I was here, I was a church kid for the most part. I didn't uh-huh. go to a lot of concerts. Most of the parties that I went to were within the members of the church would throw uh-huh. a party. Yeah. Uh, it was really when I got to college and I was 17. So, you know, I did a lot of growing up in there. And the point is, however, I went to all the concerts. Mm. I, everyone, you know, it, if the Funkadelics came three times a year, then I got to see them three times a year. And wow. for the music that I loved, I was there. And um, the rhythms, you know, the the rhythm and you you just dance and you have fun. And and also within the time of those 70s, the music was also tuning itself to the explorations we were making. Mm -hmm. We were trying to get some answers. We were trying to figure out how to set this world back on a humanistic frame. You know, Mm -hmm. we were trying to figure out black liberation. We were trying to figure out. Am I not just my body? What is this spirit? And if it's this spirit, is it like they say at church, I'm just going to live and die and go to heaven? Or am I saying this spirit is forever and there's something in the cosmos? And we were Mm -hmm. making these explorations and the musicians were doing it too and seemed to be ahead of us. Uh They seemed to already have figured some things out or they seemed to have reached into some truths and were bringing us Stevie Wonder, Earth, Wind and Fire. You know, it it was all going there. I mean, I remember when James Brown came up with uh, I'm Black and I'm Proud and people were so happy because everybody loved James and he can't start a rhythm you don't move to. It just it's right. just all the, uh, in there. But when he joined the movement clearly and mm-hmm. made that song that was a hit everywhere. So now even James and, and barbecue eating slick head southern minded folk Mm -hmm. were part of the movement now you know what i'm saying and he validated that we could be black and proud and i it was just all this was going on so that's what i'm saying now is that it doesn't change there's stuff going on now there there are issues and questions and the new generation is just as lost as we were because we don't tend to pass these truths and understandings along we don't have a lot of generational transfer Mm -hmm. and the society and the media feed so much uh fragmentation and spend so much time having you focus on everything but yourself and your people that you know you'd be you have to get 17 18 19 to start saying wait a minute but you mean black people really did something in the world? You know what I'm saying? What What do you mean? We we invented the thing yeah. that NASA had to use. You know what I mean? Uh, we, we find these things out late. Anyway, long story is short. Here we are today, 2020. Yeah. We got generations in need of answers, yeah. in need of guidance and direction. And what has been successfully done for the most part is that the most popular musics that are out here are not the ones that are providing guidance and direction and information. Mm -hmm. And the record companies have found it very beneficial, not only to their pocketbooks, but also to the manipulation of our youth to send all these uh, other messages, these downgrade, you know, downgrade yourself, your woman, your people, um, violence, uh, anti-social behavior that is not aimed at trying to uplift you but is aimed at actually destroying you yeah. you know death and destruction depression uh, pipeline to prison you know activities I mean this is what has been now yeah. created as our as our creative expression yeah it, it it's um and you know how much I love hip hop. And, and I know you had this discussion with your son, too. I've had this discussion with your son. <laughs> you know, the older I get, the more I'm understanding of definitely the context needed for some of the hip hop, you know. And uh, and with my age, even at an earlier age, it was in a better context. But as time's gone on and it's become, you know, more, um, you know, it gets uh, looser and, and looser, looser, more, and looser. More of a, a more of a engine for to make money. Mm-hmm. You know, exactly. uh, the 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 messaging in it has completely altered the way the messaging was. The same way, uh, 
brother Ayo Dele talks, talks about, you know, soul and R&B mm-hmm. becoming more over overly sexualized and lustful. Yes. As time went on from a message of like romance, mm-hmm. romance mm-hmm. and lust are completely different. Mm-hmm. You know, they're in different wheelhouses, you know, and I guess, you know, you really have to be sincere in talking to the artist about like, OK, what was what was the intent of this? You know, I mean, you know, it was deep. Um <sighs> Well, this is this is where you this is what I say is it's one thing for something to organically grow out of its community. Yeah. And it's another thing for that thing to be manufactured for the purposes of True. someone's bottom line. Yeah. So like a baby that is born into a loving family and is breastfed and nurtured and the family, the mom, the dad, the grandparents, the siblings, the community show this child love and embrace them and raise them. I mean, that even feels a certain kind of cuddly way, right? Yeah. And then there's this child that's going to be created in a um, Petri dish. Yeah. And that's going to be fed Similac out of a rubber, you know, a bottle and is going to be handed around to all different kind of uh, caretakers who, and going to be schooled and, and not going to be held a lot lovingly. And it's going to be taught to follow directions and do what they're told. And that's a ho- that doesn't even feel all cuddly and warm. No. And so now you've got you've got a different orientation. You've got a different head. You've got a different response to the world and to life coming from these two different examples. And so it's the same with our arts, the arts that are created organically out of our community and are representative of the experiences and the expressions and the feelings and the uh, ambitions and, you know, the sorrows even of that community. That coming organically out of a member of that community is one thing. Yeah. Then you got folks who show up and say, hey, nah, cha- change that lyric right there. Yeah. And now all of a sudden it moves out of that, out of what it was into something that is plastic and that is pop, yeah. <laughs> you know, and just loses its soul. It, it, and it's, it's unique because um, as you're saying that, and the older I get and just the context for some of the messaging that hip hop has provided. Uh, definitely by the time people see this, it'll be in March uh, mm-hmm. was labeled as Women's History Month. But, you know, like Black History Month, it should be every day, uh, <laughs> even if you honoring your mama. Yeah, that's right. But um, and my mom, my mom even liked them. Uh, but in a lot of ways, Snoop. Snoop Dogg's whole response to Gail King over the Kobe Bryant questions to Leslie to uh, Lisa Leslie is a classic example of of in a lot of ways Snoop is like an older brother like as much as I've listened to to his music and I think it is some tracks of definitely within his talent that go right to the traditions and freestyling of you know telling stories but his response to that it just is responding you know and even hearing my friends talk about it especially a lot of men where it's like you know snoop's always been that you know he's not a he's not a journalist and that's how he responds and it's like man but as i think about this it just feels different it just feels different you know and that's a classic example of the the context for this because in 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 his response it justifies um the language and definitely degrading what Gail did, but it's another way he can even respond, you know? And, and I think it's not as much the, like what you said, as like change this lyric. It's almost like, we're going to highlight, we're going to, we're going to shine the light and put a spotlight on you when you do this. As I follow most of Snoop's, I I follow most of Snoop's, uh, you know, Instagram or, or accounts, like I say, and everything he said about Donald Trump, Everything he said about uh, Donald Trump disconnecting with the black community will never get that spotlight. Now, this is him using what's now almost kind of like what music could be like it's it, you know, social media is in popular culture. This will be highlighted in a way through, you know, through through a lens that will be given a precedent that, you know, his political commentary in the same way would not be made. And I do feel like, man, that was disrespectful to Gail. 
I definitely don't agree with her approach to that interview. And the whole thing is you say, like, when outsiders co-opt our story, our narrative, how we do our inner work in politics and our culture, it it just leads to like a, a, a cluster of like, what is going on here? <laughs> you know, like, how do we, you know? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, I, um, we don't own our story. Mm. And it's real difficult sometimes to have these um, harsh, direct um, statements about what is and what ain't. Mm -hmm. But um, there is no national anything, no national entity for the African-American. So when there's, for instance, during this period of time when all of these uh, headlines were about the brothers and sisters being slaughtered by police, whether they were on the street, in the jail, in their car, yeah. what does all of this going on? During that highlighted period, we had an African American uh, president of the United States of America, and we also had an African American attorney general of the United States of America. Yeah, and even with those two persons in the two highest law positions or positions of law in this country we had nowhere to go to say yo our people are being slaughtered here and we need somebody to check this situation we had nowhere to go it wasn't like if i was a nigerian i could go to the nigerian embassy and at least there's a official response to what's going on with me Mm -hmm. here there is no official response because they will tell you that Barack Obama had to make it clear that he was not the president of the black people or he was not going to be the black president focused on black concerns. Yeah. And so this is just uh, this is what I'm saying. Like we didn't invent certain things. We were born into a system. Yeah. And within this system, there are some harsh realities for us. Yeah. So. We don't have a national organization or entity of any type that can check Jet Gale or Snoop or this one or that one. Yeah. We don't have one. I'll never forget. I turned on the, uh, uh, what are they called? The Triumph Award? Whatever the NAACP's awards yeah, thing is yeah. called. I turned it Image on. Award. Image Awards. Image Awards. I turned it on one year and. They at that moment I turned it on. They were doing a tribute to the life of Martin Luther King, and I caught the end of this little video, you know, honoring Martin Luther King and all of his sacrifices and uh, efforts. And they did that and clapped, and then they turned to a young brother who came out, and I can't remember his name, so I'm not going to name the wrong person. But he came out and uh, performed his hit song which was something about how to get in some girl's pants. Literally, the lyrics were something about, I want to get in your pants or something literally just out there like that. He came out with, you know, the slouchy pants and his underwear out and carrying on on national TV, on the NAACP Image Award, immediately following Martin Luther King's tribute. Yeah. And they gave this young brother an Image Award because he had a successful song. Yeah. So... I repeat, we don't have any national entity yeah. to uh, support our aims and to uh, provide a system of accountability. Hmm. So African-American people don't even have to identify as African-American, you know. So black people in America come out of any box they want to can say and do anything they want to and the only real check for them well if you go is against, the is the status quo mainstream i was gonna say if you go against uh certain cultures yeah. because i've seen it like i'm saying you know, like i i've like, farrakhan and the and the jews it's a it's a class he got checked yeah. him at, at supposed to be you know a leader yeah. with a lofty standing he gets checked by an entity that says hold up you can't say these things about us I mean, I, I just... Where's, we don't have a check department. I just interviewed uh, Jalil Muhammad, and mm-hmm. we were speaking about... Um, we were speaking a, a little bit about that, but more so into uh, <laughs> LeBron James is rapping. It's a rapper, 21 
uh 21 savage that had a song where he said i want to make money like i want to make money like a jew Mm -hmm. and lebron james works out and he raps songs or whatever and then you know the anti-defamation league came out and said okay what are you doing lebron james responded and said you know i apologize i didn't know and then that led to 21 savage saying okay i'll take that lyric off my album and then what's so funny about that same song is right after that song on that album um he has a song called, you know, I call my chopper KKK because it kills, I guess, uh, the, you know, the the uh, <laughs> N words. Mm-hmm, let's say that. Mm-hmm. Right. So a chopper is like a machine gun. And it's like, damn, this is so crazy because it's like you can have this song on the very. It's like you can have this very song. Mm-hmm. The next song. And as you say, the check in is like one second, you know, look, I was listening to something and they were bleeping out the curse words. Right. Yeah. So they bleeped out. Um, they bleeped out uh, the F word. Yeah. And they bleeped out the word for uh, bowel movement. Yeah. The S word, let's say. Yeah. They did not bleep out the B word, yeah. which is a name that women are called. Yeah. They didn't bleep that word. Yeah. That word was OK to be said. And I just was like, wow, that's deep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so I'm just saying that, you know, we are not. It's, it's interesting to me as I think about it, because I, like I say, I'm, I'm a spiritual culturalist, if I'm going to, you know, verb it up. Uh, and so uh, adjective it up. And so um, I have a value system out of which I operate. So there are things that I say, things I don't say. Things I do, things I don't do. But the whole, the majority of people who are considered African-American, that may not be their value system. True. So if I come in and say, yo, we got to clean up our whole thing. So y'all need to come join me in my thing. Everybody not coming. Mm -hmm. And so, again, like I say, that we don't have, we do not have an agreed upon standard. And we haven't been allowed to organize a national entity that could um, that could create that that could c- create and and enforce that because there is a there is a very specific and I believe there was a law passed around this that you can't have a nation within the boundaries of the United States. Republic of New Africa, free you, land. You free can't land. have right. Yeah. And what was why were they doing that? Because Without a landmass and a space where you can set the standard, where you yeah. can create the value and enforce them, then there was just no way to create a accountability and a unity amongst our people. And unity is the strength. This whole notion of fragmenting and, you know, that's, that's America. Individualism is definitely not the culture that we that we that we're birthed with in Africa. Um, well, like, even in America, even they work yeah. with the they tell you you can be a rugged individual, but you got to be a member of the American society because it is within the unity of that that the strength is maintained. Mm-hmm. And the lack of unity is where we see our weakness. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, so all of that and all of that and still we rise, you know, and still we must build and, and still and the, still. And that's and that's. <laughs> That's the the tragedy, but also the beauty of the tapestry of it as uh, one of the things that I said to myself. um, And it's a great film. But knowing that I really watched a real movie, I'm like, wow, if you could ever make a feel good movie about Dolomite, I guess Eddie Murphy Mm. is talented enough to do it. But I'm thinking to myself, like, it's going to be millions of people that actually go back and watch Dolomite and say to themselves, first off, the premise of the movie, a and then also the, the the I guess the the quality of the movie, <laughs> you know, it's like, mm. but it it's it, that's I guess the tapestry of of what exists, but still the checks and the balances, like what what is that standard, you know? Because because with within that message, it it great film, and I didn't know some of those details, and it was still certain details left out. Uh, but I uh, I was like, wow, this is like this take on Dolomite 
it, it can frame history. You're in saying a way. Eddie Murphy's take? Yes. Mm-hmm. Eddie Murphy's take on Dolomite definitely frames history in a certain way that I know certain films will never be given that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Well, this, you know, this is this is uh, Spike Lee making Malcolm X. This is it's everything. It's yeah. everything. And there, there's no. Uh, um, As you say, the check and balance within the community, because I right. definitely think if. If a, you know, like if I were to make a movie about Max Fisher, Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's going to get off the ground even for 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 showing a 10 people. That's it. I mean, this is the this is the unless it's sanctioned and and uh, the approval is provided. This is what I'm saying, like because a lot of music that has been created and celebrated as um, Mm -hmm. a successful music would not have made it past my censors huh. mm-hmm. because it's just certain things that I just don't think deserve um, a platform, a platform, especially, you know, made to represent. Are you kidding me? And so, you know, this is, this is where I'm coming from, but yeah. there are other people who will say, no, you know what he was trying to say. And mom and Gia, you just not understand it. And I'm, I ain't mad at you for those. Yeah, we've thoughts. had those discussions and I, I've, I've definitely, I've definitely at, at younger years, I've fit, I was more adamant in it. Whereas I'm a, still a firm believer in it's a context for this, but mm-hmm. it's hard to even judge when I know that some of this stuff is, you know, even in the interviews and in passing, like when people say, yo, you know, this is like Beirut in the hood, you know, if mm-hmm. you just live past five. I was uh, hip hop evolution where uh, and it's a cool documentary where they're talking about New Orleans and Master P is like, mm-hmm. you know, me and my brother used to say if you can make it past 19 and it's like, OK, there, you know, um, gun accessibility in America is very high. Gun accessibility in in urban neighborhoods are very high, which I definitely think, you know, it's not. It's not uh, it, th- these are not black people controlling these channels, getting uh, assault rifles into the community, mm-hmm. even though you may buy it from a black person, you know. Uh, but uh, so that's another government discussion to have. Uh, living past 19 is not uh, I, I don't think most people are saying that per se. It's not mm-hmm. death is not that high of a rate. W- does danger exist? Does violence is, exist? Are, are people rationalizing some of these acts and normalizing the acts? Yes. Do do people justify in American society it's more reasons possibly to kill or use a gun? I, I would say yes, because I know so many people that carry guns. But do I think that it's at a risk where most people think they're not going to make it past 19? No. Nah, See, that's the this most people. Like, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Like, individual communities, yeah. uh, neighborhoods, cities. You know, there are some realities out here that are really harsh. True. And, you know, we have privilege. We don't have all the privilege. I'm saying me and you. Mm -hmm. We have privilege. True. And um, we have articulation. True. And we have resources. And like uh, they say, some people have ways and means and some people just got hopes and dreams. Hmm. So... The fact of the matter is that I had a I was on this panel with the it was a hip hop conversation over at U of D that this brother used to uh, put on uh, every few months. Mm -hmm. I think I did two of them, maybe three. Mm -hmm. And I was brought as the old school person. So, okay, (laughs) I'll show up for you. (laughs) And I would be there with folks who, you know, were hip hop performers, promoters, this and that. And I was there with this one brother and he. He was saying that he promotes a lot of this music that is considered negative mm-hmm. by those outside of it and that he doesn't let his daughter listen to it. And so if people really think it's bad and all that, then they just shouldn't let their children listen to it. Mm-hmm. So I was like, wow. And I was like, well, but brother, you know, these the things that you're saying, he said, these are the, the one of the performers said this is uh, the reality in my community. And I said to the promoter i said well if if we find out that this is the reality of what's going the things that they're saying is actually what's going on are actually the things that are going on in their community then that's supposed to be our trigger to go fix some stuff yeah this should not be that we're not glorifying that stuff we don't want to glorify the the b and the h that we call in these women and then saying well that's how they're really living then let's go over there and see what we can do about that. Mm-hmm. But we do not have organ we are not organized in that way. Yeah. 
as a as a mass. We're not. There are people who are out here fighting a good fight on a lot of these situations and levels. I'm not discounting. Absolutely not discounting that work. Yeah. Those efforts and those successes. No discount here. I'm saying that as a people. We are not organized towards yes. our own upliftment, liberation, salvation, success, victory as a people because the those who are benefiting from us remaining labor and yeah. consumers as our primary focus, yeah. they are organized to keep us in those positions. And you sounded like... Um and I feel my dad's been putting me more up on him. You sound like Dr. Amos Wilson. Rest <laughs> in peace right now. Black mm. power is he talks about the hysteria that we live in just as black people on whatever level. And that's the we the, are not without scholarship on our situation. Mm -hmm. We can go back 100 years yeah. and read up on brothers and sisters who have analyzed our situation. And many of them have promoted solutions. Yes, we are. It's it's almost painful to watch the return of what was going on 50 years ago. And we're back at it again now. Same issues and coming at it from the same from direction. Different, but the the uh, no. the some of the, the challenges is like, as you say, you know, as technology changes, the yeah. rea the 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 root of this thing hasn't changed. Yes, the root has the not changed. The root has not changed. We are still in the position of being laborers and consumers. At one point, the only thing legal for us in this organized system known as the United States of America, the only thing legal for us was to be laborers. Yes. And then there was this time period of the release from direct enslavement as a nationally agreed upon entity. Mm -hmm. And so we entered this period where we could be laborers and consumers yeah and i i haven't seen the growth past that yeah i i can't i definitely can't uh and and those listening to this interview and it's definitely started from a from a perspective but i like it the the way that we talked about art and culture and then went right into society Right, because our art and culture from. grows out of our position in society, out yes. of our realities in society, or at least it should. Yeah. And when it doesn't, it often is manufactured by the interests, by someone else's interests. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, generally speaking, throughout histories, art and culture was an outgrowth of the experiences of the people. Mm -hmm. uh, Doc, uh, Baba Shimba used to say that culture is what a people do to survive. Mm -hmm. And so it grows out of one's interaction with the fortunes of nature and society. And mm -hmm. when it doesn't, when it, uh, well, and then when it shows up as, um, you know, uh, some really violent, aggressive, misogynistic all of those words that have been applied yeah. to uh a lot of the um, um artistic expressions of mm -hmm. this time when it appears is that then that is letting us know that there's something that needs to be taken care of mm -hmm. and our our um that's that's where i look now to say okay so in gia what instead of just being one more orator about, oh, my God, this is what's wrong with all of you people or all of us people even. Uh -huh. What is it that I'm contributing towards the solution? Where where if I if, where can I at least have one input that succeeds, even mm -hmm. though there needs to be a 100 of them? Can I get my one? Can I do in Gia's one contribution? And I think. At least for me and many people, you've done that in a lot of ways by you, the way you conduct business, the way you lead art uh, to lead people to art and the way you lead people to experiences, just the boundaries of it. Because I'm not even going to uh, and we can almost close kind of on this <laughs> whole concept. But some of from doing so many of the rap open mics and doing so many of the rap shows, whether it be like strip club or regular club, just the way business is conducted there. And I'm, and I, and it's probably, it may be even conducted like this outside of uh, just those places and spaces, the way you conducted business with me as a performer was at a level where it was like, man, 
I was performing with the basics where I'm like, damn, this is like different. It's like he, as a as a performer, they, they you could get food, <laughs> you know. And, but this is a reality that was that the frame of the, the frame of reference where I was coming from as a younger performer. And I do also think that presence and the way you carry yourself, as you say, as a as someone orator, uh, someone that does speak in different ways, uh, more familiar with language, just seeking better understandings. My presence can change certain, you know, can change the the mood of a room. I've sat through some of those panels that you were on and I know your presence changed the mood of the room. Just you walking in and let alone when you start speaking, because discussions would have definitely went a whole lot more awry <laughs> from knowing some of those artists that mm-hmm. were on those panels without you being present. And this is this is what I, this is what I tell people. Like I had to wake up one day to the fact that uh, everybody was saying yes, ma'am. Like, oh, okay, so I'm recognized as a ma'am. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not looking at me every day. So the fact that I say I'm 27, I'm really convinced of it. I'm not recognizing how others are really viewing me. And even and, when you were, I would say just with your presence, because mm. I've seen you know, <laughs> definitely indeed, your daughter, mm-hmm. she has that. Pre- you know, at you know what I'm saying? Just, <laughs> just playing, playing hide, go, you know, playing, uh, playing tag. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like sometimes you, you welcome the yes, ma'am, mm-hmm. or, or whatever their interpretation yeah. of that form of respect. Yeah, and I had to from I, presence. I had to recognize that that's how these young people were viewing me. I had to now know that I was this next generation or two generations ahead of them Mm -hmm. and that it was necessary for me then to model that. Mm. And so I don't have a problem. Old school is cool for me, you know, and I, I Mm -hmm. show up to allow for the fact that, like you said, because we don't control the, um, we don't control the media. Mm-hmm. We don't control our neighborhoods. We don't control the educational process. Da 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 da. Boom boom bomb. Yeah. Therefore, we spend a lot of time attempting to convince our young people that what we're telling them is true. That our point of view, our perspective, our set of values, our ambitions, that those are really true. When they have a bombardment from media and school and all this other stuff that's telling them something different. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, it takes into those 20s or 30s for our young people to get enough glimpse and experience within the world to go, oh, okay, my parents, because I did it too. Mm -hmm. I said my mom and them, you know, they were a bit naive. They're from the South. They don't really know. And then I had to grow up to find out that, no, that wasn't naivete. Those were choices they were making based on the principles and values that they were living by and that they wanted me to live by. And so, again, we end up working hard to convince our young people of our side of it, of our perspective of it, and our standard of it. And it's... It's a sometimes really almost impossible against the bombardment of a well-oiled machine that has all the resources and all the authority behind it to assert itself as the it. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. So then as I get to I show up as in Gia Kai. Yeah. I show up as in Gia Kai with an intention of allowing the young people to see me in a space to see how I dress, to see how I do my hair, to see the words I choose to use, to see whether I place myself at in the last seat in the back of the row or towards the front. I like for them to come to situations and they kind of just, we're in there. And then from the front of the room, somebody says, and she is going to come up now and give it. And when I get up, they go, wow, you, you're part of it. You, you mm-hmm. got something to do with the running of this. Mm -hmm. you normal looking acting person who sat here with us yeah you know what i'm saying you who i saw actually clean off the table yeah like you you actually run this thing that i'm trying to be part of yeah and so it all of that is example that i wish to share as a idea they may consider about how they conduct and make choices and you do Mm -hmm. like to 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 um at the festival because i had fluent host the um the my natural hair show Mm -hmm. and 
you know, this is something that you that you do. But this is kind of like my mom. But seeing you, you know how so, you know how things I are. Do. Your mom <laughs> does something, and it's like, ma, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And then as you see somebody else doing it, and then you're treated in a different way, and it's mm-hmm. like, oh, this is why people do that. Mm-hmm. But I paid fluent. I put his money in a thank you card, and you know his name was on the front and everything. And he was like, oh, man, Car, you you actually did all of this? And I'm like, yes. But I'm like, you mm-hmm. paid me like that. Mm-hmm. So it's almost even a different consideration of artists of like, you know, a note, you know, uh, here you go. You know, as opposed to like, you know, uh, handing somebody cash. Now, mm-hmm. in reality, the artist still wants cash. Mm-hmm. But it's a to me, that's the precedent that you set in my mind. My mom said in my mind, it's echoed again. And now an artist may, like you say, may may pick it up and conduct themselves differently. But Fluent even made a joke about it. Like, damn, dude, you pay me, you know, (laughs) you pay me like this instead of just, you know, handing me cash. Mm Because it's like just the, you know, because he's like, I've known him for so many years. I guess he's just thinking like, he's my boy. He's a guy. He's probably just going to give me. Just hand it to me and I walk on. And that's it. You know, these it's the little finesses. It's the little finesses that, um, you know, I learned going to certain, I learned going to certain um, events where being involved in these events, not just going to them, but being involved in them, where they take time to set up the chairs to make sure the roles are in perfect line, that they are, each seat is perfectly the same distance from the next seat. And they make sure that the chalkboard is cleaned off and ready and that there's chalk and and an eraser and that everything is placed and in place. Because when people walk into that kind of setting, they tend to adjust their behavior and their involvement to that. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, this thing is really together. Let me show up together. And so I learned from that. I learned from that, that, you know, that's how... um, That's how we can do, even if we're not in the most expensive hotel room. And even if all our chairs aren't the same color or same size. And even if blah, blah, whatever the other things are. To the best of our ability, let's make the best presentation possible so that these people know that we appreciate them, that we value them, and that we think what's going on here is important. Yes. And that to me is what happens when you take the time to put the payment in a card that says thanks. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That it just it just elevates it. It makes a little notch in that person's psyche like, wow. okay, this is how he does business. Yeah. Wow. He really appreciated me. We're cool. And I would have done it anyway. But man, that was nice. You know, and all these things make difference and they speak to how we value each other. And I I've learned I I was embarrassed sometimes, you know, to be in places as a teenager, as a young adult or as a young woman and not know how, that I could have done certain things that would have been more respectful of the situation or the person that I was interacting with. Mm-hmm. But I made that note and I made sure that I corrected it for the next opportunity. Because certain things, like uh, someone gave me something and I accepted it. I, they were giving me a gift. And then later on, the circumstance and the way it was done, the person said, you know, Gia, you could have given them $10, even though they were saying, don't give me anything. See. And I remember that because in my community, somebody say, hey, if I can say that 10, cool. But but you know what's so crazy <laughs> about that? That's like my mom, you know, that's like my mom speaking through you as mm. you're like such the con grew it for that even but that's what propels that spirit because like mm-hmm. what you say <laughs> you can say that 10 and right. say that 10 you know or sometimes when you see the intentionality going on with things and you've done this before too and you supported me and people even sometimes ask me like i may not be able to come to your event but i'll buy a ticket mm-hmm. and i'll say give that ticket away to somebody because i know what it takes to put together certain events mm-hmm. and then when you go to an event and it's very intentional you know they all have food a certain way and, and it's mm-hmm. like wow i see the work as somebody that puts this stuff on and it's like let me support next time i want to mm-hmm. be present yeah in what you're putting together and you could see that if they had another hundred dollars it would have been another step forward yes and so let me let me make a donation up in here or let me show up to do something or uh, they need they need a mic uh, yeah. They need a good vocal mic. Let me go grab one for them so that the next time they do. I, I went to something in our community and they brought a person from out of town who is a well-respected researcher and presenter. 
and that person's presentation is built on a uh projector uh, yeah but what do you call that powerpoint uh-huh. uh presentation and they didn't have a good setup mm-hmm. they had a really small old-fashioned style of a uh, screen mm-hmm. and the setup just at, and the level of what this woman was presenting and her status it really could have been another way and i had access to the stuff Mm-hmm. And had I known they didn't have it, if they had asked me and I, I just made sure I let certain people, I didn't want to embarrass or hurt anybody's feelings, but I was just trying to drop the dime that, hey, we have access to this kind of stuff and we would be willing to work with you yeah. to make it accessible to you because we would want people of this status to come in our community and to be Born welcomed away, knowing that, that it was a quality deal and we had what they needed to do what they had to do. True. And, you know, so again, you know, <laughs> It, you know, we've had a pretty free flowing conversation and, you know, but I, I do think that a core, a core seems to be value. Sure. You know, at the core of all of this is value and that, you know, who's interpreting the value, you know, is going to make some, you know, some things will be one way and some will be the other. But when we value each other, when we value ourselves, when we have pride and respect for ourselves and each other it shows in the way we do business it shows in what we do or don't do and um that's something that i i'm really curry i'm letting you know as i'm telling a number of people like i'm really looking at i don't want to put on another festival mm-hmm. i don't want to just create another club where the drinks are clinking in the back while somebody's doing their artic you know artistic mm-hmm. thing i want to figure out an organic way out of our community and it's today's realities to develop a presentation or a style of presentation of art and culture that makes an inroad into this notion of value and, you know, self value and self respect and mutual, you know, respect um, for one another. I'm, I'm interested to figure out how I can contribute to that. Well, I'm down and we're going <laughs> to close on that. And Detroit is different is definitely going to support that because I will support that. And yeah, I, know I think Piper's you do that. It. Well, I know you all Thank do. You. Thank you. We all do. And we I, it just hitting me to think that maybe it's not something different. Maybe we just all need to come together so that it's impactful enough to begin to get in there. I'm with it. I'm right with on, bro. I appreciate you. And I, I just want to say before we finish out mm-hmm. that this is one of the like uh, – motivating and invigorating and joyful things about being in Detroit. And that is the young people like yourself and the Piper and all these other persons that you have mentioned and not mentioned Mm -hmm. who we know are out here doing this thing and against all odds and in between and up, you know, under and around are making it happen. And it invigorates me. And so whatever resources or, Uh, You know, whatever I can bring to the party to keep that energy going and to make sure that torch is put, you know, you guys carry it to the the generation behind you. And we just keep this thing going and growing because we're going to, you know, we're we're on our way to victory. We 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 see nothing else. We we see our victory and we're going to continue to, you know, my cousin Maya closed on her uh, speech the other day. Pomoba to Tashinda. Yeah. Together, together, we will win every day. Sante Baba. Peace. Black revolutionaries, distillery owners, Italian fashion retailers, and Motown Grammy winners all share their best stories never before told in any other media outlets on Detroit is Different. Visit DetroitIsDifferent.com or download the Detroit is Different app on Apple's App Store or Google's Play Store.